Oh. <laughs> okay, should we say got it? Okay. <laughs> well, I, yep. I missed my whole thing, didn't I? Anyway, um, <clears throat> you can find out more about culinary historians of Northern Illinois if you go to our website, um, Culinary Historians of Northern Illinois, and check us out. We have events yearly. We have a community cookbook project. We have a Taste of History uh, book club and research project, the Cookery Manuscript Project. So uh, we welcome you all to get to our website and check us out and join and, and follow us along. We do have some programs that are online. We tr we're trying to get back to the in-person programs as we go along. The, uh, our vice president and co-founder is Dr. Bruce Craig, who is a noted author and culinary historian. And he's going to be introducing our speaker uh, tonight and telling us a little bit about his background. So take it away, Bruce. Uh, hi, uh, <clears throat> can you all see me? Mm -hmm. Okay, or at least hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, I only see you, Jerry, on the... Well, because I'm talking. How oh, do you have your okay. setup? Quit you talking. Have... Yeah. You have it on screen. That's okay. Yeah. As long as you can hear me. So our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Scott Alvis Barton, whom uh, I've known for quite a while, especially through the Oxford Symposium on Food and Culture, to which we've <clears throat> both been members for quite a while. And um, I wanted to get him to speak to us for a long time because his background is so interesting. And if we, if I went on about this, it would take the whole 45 minutes. So I, I hope you'll just look at his biography, which we have. I think we have it on our announcement. So you can have an idea of who he is and uh, what he's done. Uh, one thing about Scott, he's an assistant professor of, um, is it African studies and food? African food studies and anthropology. Mm -hmm. or Africana Studies and food, food Studies and Anthropology at Notre Dame University. And he's taught in lots of other places, especially in New York. Uh, the thing about Scott is, and why he's so interesting, not just the subject of what he's going to talk about, but um, uh, why he's so interesting is that he's also a chef and has been a chef for 25 years before he went fully into academics. And um, uh, he, those of us in food studies know that some of our brethren don't know much about cooking, <laughs> don't know much about the nuts and bolts of food, what, what it means. And when they look at a recipe, they just repeat it and you can't analyze it. And that's what Scott does. And he knows where it comes from, how it's manufactured, all the nuts and bolts of cooking. And that, as he said, in a, one of the bios I <clears throat> read about you is that um, you're interested in practice and theory to understand the underpinning of theoretical precepts and food in general. That is to say, uh, the high and low approach. And I think this is the only way to really get at food studies. It's why Culinary Historians of Northern Illinois, our main project is collecting manuscript recipes that have never been looked at from various sources. And it is that mixture of practical and what and theoretical, what they tell us about the Midwest. So uh, I'm not gonna go on uh, about all the other interesting things he does, especially in Brazil. And uh, I'm sorry we can't do this in person so that you can make some uh, Brazilian dishes from the Bahia, which would be really interesting, maybe at other time. Um, anyway, he's gonna talk to us about another exotic place, not just Brazil or um, Geechee culture on the, in the Sea Isles, but the Midwest. So with that, Scott, Alvis Barton. Okay, thank you so much, Jerry and Bruce. I'm gonna share my screen and get this party started. Okay. Okay, so um, 
I'm a little bit out of my depth. As Bruce alluded to, I do most, most of my work has been in Northeastern Brazil, looking at the intersection of sacred and secular foodways among Afro-Brazilian communities in several geographies. I do do some work in the United States and partly because you can't always get to Brazil. And we also had that little thing called a pandemic. Um, and so I've done some work that tends to be kind of historical, often around Gullah Geechee communities, um, as well as second wave black feminism in New York where food was an organizing tool. So let's go. I wanna thank both the culinary historians of Northern Illinois and the NIU Libraries Regional History, History Center for inviting me to give a talk today on what I'm calling African diaspora foodways in Chicago land. Beginning anthropologically, I feel the need to center myself and why I'm here, aside from the gracious invitation that you all have extended to me. I, as Bruce said, because we had talked earlier at the Oxford Food Symposium. I come to you as an African diaspora food waste and, uh, scholar, and to a lesser degree, I'm a public scholar aligned to the call and response diaspora collective at Linden Sculpture Garden, which I recommend you all come to when we're doing things throughout the year, which is in Milwaukee. And there, my work is largely domestic, historical, and likely all my research, and like all of my research, is grounded in women's work, women's knowledge, intergenerational teaching and learning, heritage practices, and intercultural relationship that affect the politics of, politics of identity across the Black Atlantic. Coming to this topic is wholly unique to me. Given the breadth and depth and scope of the subject, I will do what I can to contribute to what could and should be someone else's doctoral dissert dissertation. There's enough material from the little bit I've gleaned that could make a great PhD project. As you all may know, foodways and commensal traditions are complicated to research. When we leave the domain of the hegemon or the elites, whose histories are generally available in the archive, when and if food cultures have been collected and saved. So to research a so-called subaltern social group like African-Americans or African diasporans requires alternate and oblique lines of inquiry. To that end, and you'll see in some of the images I'm gonna present, I first started looking at song lyrics, thinking about songs like Sugar My Bowl, um, et cetera, because Chicago had been uh, second to New York, one of the biggest publishing areas, uh, houses, a home to many publishing houses in the 20th century. Um, that was not that fruitful. I looked at literature to a certain degree and poetry of some noted Chicagoans like Richard Wright and, and Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, the Green, Victor Green's Green Book, the um, Black's Blue Book and Scott's Blue Book um, that like the blue book you may be familiar with that is a guide for elite whites historically. The Blacks Blue Book and Scots are um, geared to, in quotes, colored community and their access to social events, uh, not quite the same social register and businesses of that ilk. Uh, I looked at a lot of newspapers uh, mostly black newspapers in Chicago, um, as well as some things currently produced. And so with that, I'm going to really begin. I have more questions than answers, and we'll look forward to a discussion afterwards. So as I guess I should, I'm going to begin with Jean-Baptiste Pont du Sable, who I know that this group probably knows. And it's interesting when I was looking for him because as much as there is information, there's sort of a paucity of information. I particularly was intrigued that a lot of people in looking at uh, various archives were quick to identify his white father, or French father, or French Canadian father, but were scant information about his mother who was Haitian and he was born in Saint-Domingue and migrated to New Orleans around 1765. And then somewhere around 1769, 1770, he got shipped right and ultimately made his way from New Orleans up north and came up the Mississippi. And we know that he's considered the uh, founder of Chicago of sorts. Um, and as the founder, he is the first non-white. Um, or I, I, I can't get the paraphrase, but there's a great quote from the Potawatomi about the first white man to found the city is not white, something 
to that, I agree. Um, but I bring, bring him up as a first question because one moves too closer to where Peoria is today. But while he was in the Chicago area, he set up a trading post and he had flour, pork, and bread. Green Bay, Mackinac, and St. Joseph that helped the, the burgeoning settlement to flourish. So one of the questions that came up for me that I guess I would need a... Um, archaeologists, and I don't know if that would work, is we know that um, he's coming just before the Haitian Revolution in 1804, and there had been a lot of exchanges of goods and people between Haiti or Saint-Domingue and New Orleans, and considering New Orleans as the northernmost part of the point of the Caribbean. And as we hear with him, he comes up from that area to uh, the Great Lakes. And so I'm curious, since we can agree along with Eric Hobsbawm about food and memory and collective identity of a social group, um, how much or what part of what he brought with him? Oh, why is this not moving? Oh, why? No, there we go. Um, is and this is one of the images of him, allegedly. How much of his food did he bring or nostalgically want to have? I know from doing research on Portuguese as they went from Portugal um, down to Cape Horn and then to, to Goa and then to China, often, and you see it in Macanese food, <laughs> in Southern China, you see um, things that look Portuguese but taste of China, of Portugal, of India mixed together. And in that iteration, much like Du Sables, we have Portuguese men who are cohabitating, maybe raping um, Chinese Muitsa women and uh, South Asian, South Indian women. Um, and so you see some of their influences since they are the culture bearers and the cooks in the house. So how much can we imagine that whether through foraging or trade, since he traded so, so far and wide, could he have brought with him or tried to reestablish some of the dishes we celebrate that go back to the colonial era in one shape or another, like griot, like soup jamu, that comes a little bit after his arrival because it's a, a soup for the elites, that's the New Year's soup, that's the liberation soup, made with a calabash pumpkin and variety of meats and, and today pasta, et cetera, and it, or pickles, the spicy pickle fermented dish would be easy to produce. Um, and in the spirit of it, there's an interesting article I found uh, by this woman, Brigitte Malvet, who is Haitian, who tried to imagine what would a colonial, uh, a Haitian dessert look like without colonial influence. And she ends up making a pudding with guava um, that is more like a porridge. It reminds me of Mungunza in Brazil, where it's a cornmeal porridge, and she's got coconut milk in it um, and sugar, cane sugar, and then stewed guava, and she cooks it and has it uh, set up in a banana leaf to make it feel like it's from the islands. And so I, I throw that out as the first question that I want to think about uh, as we move forward because people always, they may or may not come empty handed, but they don't come empty headed, as my friend Henry Truel says. And I think that one of the things we always try to do as immigrants and migrants is reproduce some part of the foods that we hold dear, whether they're spiritual or quotidian. And this brings to mind my friend and mentor, Jessica Harris, and her statement of six cooking techniques that identify African cooking which she lists as uh, food ways, or excuse me, dishes composed of rice or legumes. And I, um, I don't know if I did it. Uh, like the Haitian um, sauce pois Congo or peas and rice, much like our hop and John, 
um, fritter making or frying, a deep fat frying, which the griot in a traditional method after you've uh, marinated and cooked the pork, you fry it so it's got a crunchy edge and a tender center. Um, uh, uh, use of starches that can be used as a binder or like fufu as a um, something to adhere sauces to. And we see uh, with malanga on the island um, or cassava, the same kind of dish like fufu. Now those don't grow in North America. So what would he have done if anything or asked Catherine, his wife to do? The use of okra, nuts and seeds as thickeners, abundant use of green and leafy vegetables and uses of hot sauces and pepper for flavoring. And so again, I have okra here. I don't know if he would have been able to get crab, but this crab and pork stew that are all redolent of Haiti and all are dishes handed down within African diaspora culture. And so we don't, I don't think, and the little I know, because I'm new to this area, I lived in the Midwest as an undergraduate a million years ago, and I'm coming back to the Midwest. And so I'm learning it all again. And I've recently got an apartment in Chicago, so that's new too. Um, so I'd like us to think about that as we move forward. And could he have had an effect in the food ways in that period? Um, and I'm going to jump around to go because there's so much to cover here. But so I'm going from the 18th century and then briefly uh, were this a week later, I'm going to go this Saturday on a hike in this new uh, Underground Railroad um, uh, route that's along the Calumet River that involves um, portaging on a boat. Uh, in southern Chicago by the Indi Indiana border. And I raise that to say, when we look at population statistics, you have a considerable amount of people who are African-American, more than likely enslaved, um, before abolition in the Chicago area, as a French before it becomes English territory. So again, what did, what were their contributions? Uh, whether they were home cooks in plant urban settings or in plantation homes in the area, or if they became free people of color. How can we imagine what they brought to the mix? Um, so I'm going to quickly, I'm throwing that out there, these two antecedents, and now I'm going to jump into the 20th century. So there's estimates that in 1916, the population of African Americans, or and throughout this lecture, I'm going to use the words based on what's in the archive, uh, Negro and colored, based on the historical reference. Not that I approve of them. Uh, the estimates range that there are somewhere between forty thousand to one hundred and seventy-five thousand, a big uh, swath, uh, with definitive information on local activities of the race still lacking. Although colored men and women are represented almost in every line of activity in Chicago in the teens. Additionally, thousands lived in Evanston, Gary, Indiana, Blue Island, and other suburbs. The 1914 census of the Chicago Board of Education counted 54,557. And if you index that for, with 3% growth rate, which was typical of the era, you would have about 75,000 by 1916. Um, uh, but people who were perturbed by the influx of Africans or African descended peoples um, stated that there was 175,000, which sounds like it's a little bit off base. Um, and uh, Tracy Poe has put them somewhere in the middle and suggested it's about 60 to 70,000 based on her estimates. Uh, she wrote her dissertation at Harvard under Henry Gates about immigrant foodways in the Chicago area, both black and white. Um, and so we're in a little bit of a conundrum. She says there's about 2 million people in the greater area, a little over, a little under 2 million people in the greater area. Um, and as you know, we have our first census in 1790, but uh, the early census in the 1800s get destroyed in fire. And so there's some of that material we just can't get access to. That's why there's conjecture. In this period that I'm talking about in the teens and 20s, nearly half of the colored population lived in the second ward, where 78% of the voters were Negro. First ward 
colored population is estimated at 7,000 7, and nearly as many in the 30th, followed by the 3rd, 31st, 14th, and 6th in that order. I don't know if it reads well, but the wards as of 1910 are in the map that you're seeing. The largest concentration of Negroes live between 29th and 35th streets, though real estate professionals predict that soon they will all live throughout the area as far east as the lake. Many um, people bought in Inglewood in what was considered a high-class district with a saloon element that developed around East 55th and Lake Park Avenues. In no other city in the U.S. do they feel such responsible positions in political, industrial, and professional fields at that time, suggesting a promising future for their people. Yet despite the fact that the few colored men who, who receive political preferment and jobs come with political exploitation, of the Negro race in Chicago by designing whites. In some, and I quote this, this is all from The Negro in Chicago, written in 1916 by Junius Brown. In some Negro districts, political favor is generated by making money through disorderly saloons, all night cabarets, shady hotels, disorderly houses, gambling clubs, and other influences of destruction. As you see by this graphic, the, the uh, most common points of employment by Blacks at this time, and I've highlighted the things that relate to food, and I'll just stick with those, butchers, housemaids, housemen, bartenders, cooks, waiters, and saloon porters. Um, and I couldn't ascertain if this was in a hierarchy that showed percentages. Um, and again, to quote from Junius Brown, the colored man has a pride in his work and in his job. And, the, and in the concerns he works for, his living expenses are always greater than his income. Unlike the immigrant European, he does not send one quarter of all he earns to some country in Europe. His ideas are American, and he is not against the law and always scheming to strike or riot or wreck the plant of his employer. So on the surface, we have this depiction of the uh, colored population as being a potentially good uh, injection of labor for the city. And as I said, these are some of the references I looked at. I went through, these were at the Museum of the History of Chicago, um, quite interesting in and of themselves. Um, in an interview, banker of this period, Jesse Binga said, I'm an Irishman. You won't find any other colored people like me. Most of the colored businessmen in Chicago have started with nothing, for the race is young and as free people in the nation and still younger in the North. Few of them, aside from professional men, have got beyond the stage of small business, which is an interesting um, quote. I don't know if I would totally agree with it um, about being free and easy. Nearly 90% of the Chicago's colored population is somehow employed. This is a statistic of the time. Yet complaints of excuse me, unsatisfactory re results of their work by employers. A man employed in the Wabash branch of the YMCA complained that he had lost his job. S Secretary A.L. Secretary Jackson asked him if he had reported to work every day of each week that he was employed. And his response was, goodness, no, I just had to have some days of the week off for my pleasure. So we see a little bit of uh, some disjuncture there. Yet the importation of Negro laborers from the South continued, despite on the one hand saying that we are good workers, and the other hand saying we might be lazy or wanting to run the show our own way. Uh, and at this period, they quote that 195 Louisiana men had arrived in one par in one parcel to work, to hire to work for the stockyards in one of the stockyard businesses. So there's a desire to bring blacks there. There are some blacks who are beginning to migrate uh, on their own and there is ready employment and they're fully employed. Now, subtext is they're probably being employed at a much uh, lower wage rate and with uh, lower safeguards than the, their white counterparts. Um, and again, to quote, com conversely, once colored help is used, it is seldom discharged. So if you get them, you keep them, and it suggests to me again that the conditions are, are profitable, even if they are not as 
the best workers you could imagine. The waiters in a well-known film quick chain of lunchrooms in Chicago once struck on the promise of being taken into the union. And then they found themselves out of both union, out of the union and their jobs. This is about the only strike on record in the period. After barring them for many years, that company had a few weeks ago started rehiring them and employing them as short order cooks. So we have, again, these funny, you know, there's a thing that I'm, I keep coming into looking at this material where there is ingenuity and resilience and adversity and prejudice kind of all wrapped together. And at this point, one of the things that keep coming up in the archive is that all the businesses are not on the South side, which was largely a white neighborhood uh, for a large part of it. Um, and it was evidenced by restaurants and delicatessens, for example, one on Broadway and Lawrence. And the Chicago National Business League uh, classified Negro owned businesses in Chicago at that time in the teens as being five bakeries, four confectioners, four fish markets, 33 groceries and delicatessens, four ice cream parlors, 63 restaurants and saloons. Ostensibly among, and these are all from the Blue Book and, and Scott's, ostensibly among various ethnic and racial groups, the sentiment is that the intercultural interracial patronage of Negro and white businesses is necessary as a fact of doing business in Chicago to maintain your business uh, profit profitability. This is exemplified by two saloon owners that I will cite, Isidore Levin's Panama Saloon, which was on the southeast corner of South State Street and 35th, that had that should have had two licenses. He had a corner bar and a 150-seat cabaret room with an orchestra and four to five vocalists at any given time at the street level, and a larger cabaret with a baby grand piano, more seating and dancing space reached only through an inside stair in the building's second floor. So technically, he was running two businesses out of one. Officially, the Wacker and Burke Brewing and Malting Company is Levin's registered business at this site. All 60 of his employees were colored, and the patrons were both white and colored. Some Negroes came well-dressed and well-behaved, while others are noisy in Mackinac's and sweaters. Whites are conspicuous as slummers, in quotes. In this neighborhood, there are interracial buffet flats where white men can sort of colored women frequently. Just north of his saloon at 3445 South State is the, the nightclub Elite Number no. Two, running run by Henry Tienan Jones, that was smaller and but similar to Panama with backroom patrons having two businesses in one. Tienan, as he was known, is the colored ruler of that underworld district with repeated dealings with local police who hesitated to cite him with any infractions or close his gambling tables. So he was obviously giving kickbacks. He was part of the local black mafia. While other local saloons closed their doors at, at 1 a.m., there was always a line of automobiles and patrons on the street and on the sidewalks into the early hours of the morning up till dawn, waiting to get into elite number two. So he was able to circumvent the law completely. Other similar properties existed by the old 22nd Street Levy and Sal Joy Colanger's saloon on the southeast corner of 301 East 37th that disrupted an otherwise quiet colored neighborhood despite protests by the local residents. Entrepreneur Adam Ortisfian, friend of then Mayor Harrison, had issued Collinger's license that, and Ortisfian owned the British corporation that owned the local brewery that supplied the saloon with beer and financing to maintain their business. The local dis, quote unquote disorderly hotels, buffet flats and painted women on local streets along with the loud profanity and vulgarity that arose around these saloons was ignored by the police to the consternation of the local black populace. So this is what we see in the teens and 20s. And I, I will leave some of these ads up because I, I ask you to look at them. I know you this group would probably do it anyway, but we can see certain dishes in the top center, um, the curry gumbo and the chicken and shrimp shack. There's a preference throughout the ads I saw for chicken identified as from Georgia. We'll see things like uh, chitlins and pig's feet, not uncommon, but it's interesting that what is marketed as necessary. And if we look to Tracy Poe, who's somebody I, I looked at her dissertation, one of the things it's not only for blacks, but for most immigrants and migrants at that period is 
we see in the early part of the 20th century, as you all probably know, the birth of refrigeration, which is what helps to cement your stockyard culture and businesses so that you can cut uh, large cuts of meat and then in refrigerated or, or freeze, frozen cuts of uh, master cuts, you can then send it across the country. And that also on a more local level allows for refrigeration and instead of the green grocers, the beginning of the birth of supermarkets that often are seen as, as a legacy of Chicago. And the shift from uh, ethnic markets, green grocers, the kind of cheesemonger, butcher, et cetera, to the, the anonymity of a supermarket. And on the one hand, we see that in the quote unquote ethnic market, we can look at collective memory again, and we can look at the those things that come up from the South, that whether it's um, scuppernog wine or uh, meha jelly or these kinds of local products or okra, et cetera, and the ability to buy products on time so that if we all got paid on Friday, and we needed produce or what have you on Tuesday, they knew we were good for it. But at the same token, if let's say Bruce was unemployed and his spouse had come to buy and for a week or two, she doesn't have the money to pay, then the neighborhood knows that Bruce is either unemployed or no account or a drunk or shiftless. And so everybody knows your business. And the supermarkets, as they start to arise, have an anonymity, you have to have money at hand. Some of the costs are more expensive, but you can do two things. You don't have to listen to the gossip that want to say know what's going on in your neighborhood. And you can eat out of your ethnic or racial group. And so you can experiment with foods that you may not have been exposed to, particularly the great migrators as they start to come up. They know the food from the South, but how much do they know Polish or other cuisines that are, are readily available within their uh, respective ethnic enclaves. And so I think it's interesting that when we see this disjuncture and the this push that ultimately the supermarkets with their ability to um, have multi-unit, multi-platform units so they can uh, cut costs in ways that push out these small local markets that end up not succeeding um, past the war years. So we lose the ability for at least people who are coming from this nation and not having things that are coming from abroad, shipped from abroad, they use that kind of center. And that starts to resurface in the, the 50s and 60s as a byproduct of um, farmers and sharecroppers who have a little bit of land that they can cultivate and above and beyond whoever they're working for in the deep south from where some of these people are migrating from as SNCC and the SCLC try to get initially get them to come together for voting rights. Um, we see they're also trying to teach literacy and trying to subvert the fact that when they have product they want to bring to market, they cannot sell it. And that's one of the legacies of the segregated Jim Crow South where, okay, if you're going to be able to uh, develop watermelon, what have you, uh, we're not going to let you get it to market so you can make a profit, so you can stay in business. And that's twofold. We know from looking at Psyche uh, williams Forson's work that one of the ways that some of these quote-unquote Southern and or Black and or cultural um, holdovers from the continent, like watermelon, okra, uh, black eyed peas that come with the slaves. Um, there's racist advertising. The classic is the watermelon bigger than your head kind of advertising to subvert and objectify uh, and negatively fetishize the black uh, products and producers. But this work in the late 50s, early 60s by SNCC and SCLC to try to give a leg up to the black farmers in the Black Belt in Alabama, Mississippi, that people like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, a champion, give them uh, 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 the idea, let's find the places these people are migrating to, Detroit, South Bend, where I live, Chicago, and make those products available to them. 
I'm going to show you, a, 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 just to give you a, a, a pit stop here, a kind of quick decade by decade from various black newspapers. And you see in one place the date um, and that I was intrigued that in the 19th century, you have a rest, you know, uh, a cafe that's just defining itself as a restaurant and a few other places defining themselves as a restaurant and what it is they use to promote themselves, as well as in this Glencoe, Winnick and Highland Park area that are selling houses, but it has picnic grounds, grocery stores, meat markets, bakery, and a lumber yard, interesting combination. And if I go here, um, again, back to 1916, I, you know, range of material I was trying to sift through to get a quick sketch of what could be relevant for our use. Um, advertisements from newspapers, an article about the value of the peanut um, as an, an industry and as well as a food, a food stuff. You know, it's a, a well, why is this not going? There we go. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the nightclub scene is interracial, kind of interesting in this period um, that we're seeing what seems like cafe society in New York that I know better, where more than likely whites can go to black clubs. It's questionable if blacks can go to white clubs. That's not very clear from what I read. Um, but that in this tuxedo cafe, Chinese and American restaurant on the South side, um, much like um, the Jews and Chinese food in New York City, how is it perceived? Is it considered exotic? Are you seen as quote unquote somewhat elite because you're having this international dish? Um, and we see at the Savoy, they have the latest Parisian creations. Um, so they're, they're pushing themselves to a burgeoning middle class in addition to Bessie Smith, who's got Nash recognition. Um, and we get into the 30s and you see. So one of the things I looked at also, as I said, I, I reread parts of Black Boy and um, uh, Maud Martha and Native Son to look at how these people talked about food. I'm gonna read you a little bit from Maud Martha first that Gwendolyn Brooks, as I think, again, you know, but just to give her a little context, when she was six weeks old, this future Pulitzer Prize winner and poet laureate of Illinois for 32 years became a great migrator when her parents left Kansas for Chicago, escaping Jim Crow's racism. As a foundational member of Chicago's Black Renaissance, she came to know and learn from writers like Langston Hughes. And in turn, she mentored young poets such as Sonia Sanchez, Don L. Lee, and Nikki Giovanni, as well as members of the Blackstone Rangers, a local street gang. Her one novella, Maud Martha, has an insightful piece of food writing and speaks of the time, economics, and skill in the kitchen. So I want to mark this moment in the sense that from the teens to like the 40s, we're seeing what sounds like in the archive a certain class differentiation. And we saw, like I said, in some of those ads, restaurants, even in the 19th century, in a black newspaper, so that you have to have some means to be able to consume outside of the home. But when we look at uh, Brooks and Wright, it's really more about lack. And I'll read this from her. Um, Maud Martha was fighting with a chicken, the nasty, nasty mess. It had been given a bitter slit with the bread knife, and the bread knife had been biting into that vomit-looking interior for more than five minutes without being able to detach certain resolute parts from their walls. The bread knife had it all to do, as Maud Martha had no intention of putting her hand in there. Another hack, another hack, stuff, splat in her eye. She leaped at the faucet. She thought she had praise coming to her. She was doing this job with less stomach curving than ever before. She thought of the times before the war, when there were more chickens than people to buy them, and butchers were happy to clean them and even cut them up. None of that now. In those happy, happy days, if she had opened up a chicken and seen it all unsightly like this and smelled it all smelly, she would have scooped up the whole batch of slop and rushed it to the garbage can. Now meat was jewelry and she was practically out of red points. You're luckily, you were lucky to find a chicken. She had to be as brave as she could. People could do this. People could cut a chicken open, take out the mess with bare hands or a bread knife, pour water in as in a bag, pour water out, shake the carps, 
by neck or by legs, free the stragglers of water, could feel that insinuating slipping bone, survey that soft, that headless death. The faint hearted could do it. But if the chicken were a man, cold man with no head or feet and with all that little fe feather, feather, hair to be pulled and the intestines loosened and beginning to ooze out and the gizzard yet to be grabbed and the stench beginning to rise. And yet the chicken was a sort of a person a respectable individual with only one kind of dignity. The difference was in the knowing. What was unreal to you, you could deal with violently. If chickens were ever to be safe, people would have to live with them and know them, see them loving their children, finish the evening, finishing the evening meal, arranging jealousy. When the animal was ready for the oven, Maud Martha smacked her lips at the thought of her meal. One of her most iconic poems, Brooks's most iconic poems, provides readers with a snapshot of the twilight of an aging couple eking out an existence after a life littered with memories of prior good times, again announcing lack. And I'll read a very short poem, The Bean Eaters. They eat beans mostly, this old yellow pear. Dinner is a casual affair. Plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood. Tin flatware. Two who are mostly good. Two have, who have lived their day, but keep on putting their clothes and putting things away. And remembering. Remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls, and cloths, and tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. The bean eaters. To look at right, see in both Native Son and Black Boy, he has some culinary references that uh, identify lack, hunger, and a reality of mid 20th century underclass driving Blacks. And for that matter, other immigrants could be put in that uh, uh, continuum. And we see in Black Boy, his mother is a cook and a domestic of white elites. And I'll read a little bit from uh, those pieces. And as you may already know, um, the native son is built on a true story about uh, a man named Robert Nixon, who was a, for want of a better word, a serial killer um, in Los Angeles area. Um, Bigger did not want to work, only consenting to do when his mother informed him that relief could cut off their food supply if he did not accept work. Even when the relief offers you a job, you don't take it till they threaten to cut off your food, she said. Cipher, right cipher for Bigger Thomas, the serial killer Robert Nixon, and I quote, they gave us that after they whipped and kicked us and made us confess, end quote. That was Robert Nixon speaking. As he talked yesterday, Nixon's dull's, uh, dull eyes lighted only when he spoke of food. This is from the newspaper, the Chicago Defender and the Chicago Daily Tribune in 1938. They fed him well at the detective bureau, bureau, he said. He likes coconut pie and strawberry pop. It was a generous meal of these refreshments and he confessed two of his most shocking mur murders, those of Mrs. Edna Warden and her daughter Marguerite a 12-year-old in Los Angeles last year. Nixon dwelt lightly or not at all on his crimes yesterday. The ordeal of his confession was over. He felt, when it was over, he felt purged. He stretched in the warm sunshine that came through the window and smacked his lips as Chief Sullivan allowed him to order his supper. More pie, more pop, some good sandwiches. Good sandwiches this time. He didn't want any more like the last ones. And on Sullivan's desk in the same sunlight that bathed Nixon, Sheriff Seaver's letter still lay, and I quote, it had been demonstrated here that nothing can be done with Robert Nixon, only death can cure him, end quote. And from that, to look at um, Native Son, and I quote, she left Vera on the bed and turned a pair of cold eyes upon Bigger. Suppose you wake up some morning and find your sister dead. What would you think then? Suppose those rats cut our veins at night when we sleep. No, nah, nothing like that ever bothers you. All you care about is your own pleasure. Even when relief offers you the most no, the most a job, you won't take it till they threaten to cut off your food and starve you. Bigger, honest, you know, you most no account is man I ever seen in my life, said his mother, said his sister Vera. You won't tell me, you done told me that a thousand times, he said. Well, I'm telling you again, and mark my words, some of these days you're going to sit down and cry. 
Some of these days you're going to have to wish you had made something of yourself instead of just a tramp, but it's, it'll be too late then. Stop prophesizing about me, he said. I prophesy as much as I please, and if you don't like it, you can get out. We can get along without you. All I ever do is try to make a home for you children, and you don't care. Oh, Ma, Vera protested. Don't say that. Vera, sometimes I just want to lay down and quit. Vera began, went behind the curtain, and Bigger heard her trying to comfort their mother. He got up, lit a crush of cigarette on the windowsill. She came back in her room, placed knives and forks on the table. Bet ready to eat, y'all, the mother called. He sat at the table. The odor of frying bacon and boiling coffee drifted to him from behind the curtain. His mother's voice floated to him in song. So we see if we continue there, that there is very little to eat. The combination of bacon, coffee, and he continually goes for cigarettes are really his repast. The, further in the same text, it goes, pass the bread and stop being smart. You don't have to see Mr. Dalton at 5.30, his mother said. You done said that 10 times. I don't want you to forget, son. You know how you have to forget. I'll lay off Bigger, but he said. He told you he was coming to take the job. Don't tell him nothing, Bigger said. You shut your mouth, buddy, or get up from the table, their mother said. I'm not going to take any of the stick and sass from you. One from the family is enough. Lay off, Ma. Bigger setting there is, isn't he going to get him a job. And it goes on. If you get that job, his mother said in a low kind of tone of a voice, busy slicing a loaf of bread, I can fix up a nice place for you children. You could be comfortable and not have to live like pigs. Bigger ain't decent enough to, to think of anything like that, his sister said. I wish you'd all get me, let me eat my food, Bigger replied. He lays his fork down in silence, tinkling with his brother's fork on his brother's plate. I wish you'd let me eat. And this goes on and on. I don't want to dwell on it, but this trying to make a meal of nothing or very little and ongoing bickering that suggests hunger and the need to really have a substantive meal that's really not coming. And we see the same in Black Boy where uh, when, he con when his mother confronts him which we know this black boy is a, a really an autobiography of Wright's own life. Um, his mother confronts him and she's asking him, who brings the food into my house, into the house? She asks him, well, Papa does. He always brought food. Well, your father isn't here now. Where is he? I don't know. But I'm hungry. I whimpered, stomping my feet. You'll have to wait until I get a job and buy food, she said. As the day slid past, the image of my father became, became associated with my pangs, of hunger, and whenever I felt hunger, I thought of him with a biological bitterness. My mother finally went to work as a cook and left me and my brother alone in the flat each day with a loaf of bread and a pot of tea. When she returned at evening, she would be tired and dispirited and would cry a lot. Sometimes when she was in despair, she would call us to her and talk to us for hours, telling us that we now had no father, that our lives would be different from those other children, that we must learn as soon as possible to take care of ourselves to dress ourselves, to prepare our own food, and that we must take upon ourselves responsibility of the flat while she worked. One evening, she even pulled me aside and taught me how to go shopping for food. She took me to the corner store to show me the way. I was proud. I felt like a grown-up. The next afternoon, I looped the basket over my arm and went down the, the pavement toward the store. When I reached the corner, a gang of boys grabbed me, knocked me down, snatched my basket, took my money, sent me running in a panic. To keep us out of mischief, she often took my brother and me with her to her cooking job. Standing hungrily and silently in the corner of the kitchen, we would watch her go from stove to sink, from cabinet to table. I always loved to stand in the white folks' kitchen when my mother cooked, for it meant that I got occasional scraps of bread and meat. But many times I regretted having to come, for my nostrils would, have, would, be, would be assailed with a scent of food that did not belong to me, which I was forbidden to eat. Toward evening, my mother would take the hot dishes into the dining room where the white people were seated, and I would stand as the near dining room door as possible, as near as possible to the dining room door to get a quick glimpse of the white faces gathered around the loaded table, eating, laughing, and talking. If the white people left anything, my brother and I would eat well, but if they did not, we would have our usual bread and tea. Watching the white people eat would make my stomach churn and would grow vaguely angry. 
Why could I not eat when I was hungry? Why did I always have to wait until others were through? I could not understand why some people had enough food and others did not. I now found it irresistible to roam through the day while my mother was cooking in the kitchens of white folks. And lastly, hunger stole me slowly that I, at first I was not aware of what hunger really meant. Hunger had always been, hunger had always been more or less at my elbow where I play, but now I began to wake up at night to find hunger standing at my bedside, staring at me gauntly. The hunger that made me beg constantly for bread. And when I ate a crust or two, I was satisfied. But even this new hunger baffled me, scared me, made me angry and insistent. Whenever I begged for food now, my mother would pour me a cup of tea, which would still clamor in my stomach for a moment or two. But a little later, I would feel hunger nudging my ribs, twisting my empty guts until they ached. I would grow dizzy and my vision would dim. I became less active in my play. And for the first time in my life, I had to pause and think of what was happening to me. Mama, I'm hungry. Jump up and catch a hung catch a kungry. She would laugh. What's a kungry? It's what little boys eat when they get hungry. What does it taste like? I don't know. And why do you tell me to catch one? Because you said that you were hungry, she said, smiling. I sensed she was teasing and it made me angry. But I'm hungry. I want to eat. You'll have to wait. So I want to do it now. So I say all that to give us a, a sense of that period in the uh, post-war years. This is what I was referring to earlier about SNCC, and it's a, a segment of the Lowndes County, Alabama um, newspaper put out by the first chapter of the Black Panthers, as I said earlier, to try to galvanize local people to who were functionally illiterate, so they made these kind of comic strip cartoons to teach them beginnings of literacy, but about voting, about citizenship, and about bringing their food to market and with these kind of pictorial images. And this was all also part of the work that Fanny Lou Hamer did, which ultimately for our purposes contributed to getting distribution channels coming up from Alabama, Mississippi, to Chicago, Detroit, et cetera. So people who had migrated could have food um, that they knew from home up in the North. And so now I, I'm gonna quickly go through um, the 60s and then uh, talk you a little bit to the present day. And we see again, Chitlins, Georgia's finest chickens, um, uh, the preferent, uh, prevalence of barbecue throughout. Uh, it's said that one of the dishes that comes out of Chicago, the stockyards and the Great Migration are rib tips. And that rib tips are really a Chicago um, invention within the lexicon of barbecue culture. But if you look through some of these images that I've presented to you, you see um, social, not surprisingly, um, uh, fraternal societies, social engagements, um, I was intrigued that Rossi's Pizza also has shrimps, fried chicken, coleslaw, barbecue ribs, as well as pizza. Um, sounds almost like something you'd find today in the 2000s and not uh, the 60s. And obviously, I, I would like to go to the Karsh Library, which I wasn't able to get to, to look at their menu collection to pair some of these with their menus, which um, and even the, you know, I thought this was quite intriguing that Amos and Andy, who we know were not black men, um, are reported in the, the uh, Chicago Defender as giving all of these candy bars. And so this very interesting weaving between race, between races, between um, product, be able to eat differently, um, to occupy different parts of town, to have much like we see in the 60s for middle class people, engagement with quote unquote gourmet foods or foreign foods. Um, you see here, if I can move you all. Roast, you know, this is a, a the Chicago Defender, a recipe for roast duck and cookies for breakfast, in addition to uh, a news item about somebody who got uh, burned 
while they're cooking in a black restaurant. And I would be remiss if I didn't think about some of the, I'm going to use Helen Anglin as a cipher for all of these uh, cooks and or chefs that made up the mid to late 20th century in quote soul food scene in Chicago, as well as we have them in New York and Detroit, et cetera, that really like many regional and ethnic and racialized food ways, build community and become a, not only a place to eat, but a gathering place to establish themselves. And, and you see here from this um, uh, reference that is from Tracy Poe's dissertation that it was her 67th birthday in 1997, her 50th anniversary in business. Unfortunately, she died soon afterwards. And you see in yellow quotes from her two daughters about her importance to them um, and her restaurant closed in, in, uh, in Stony Island Drive um, soon thereafter, and, and their children did not restore it. But in her time, she was an icon, much as we can think of Leah Chase or Sylvia in New York City, or Mama Dip in um, North Carolina. The ubiquitous rib, rib tips that I know you all are probably familiar with. And now I'm going to come to a close and look at where things are today. And I really wanted to focus, you know, I would admonish everyone if you don't already, thinking about the little snippet I've given you how do we manage and maintain a relationship with these black businesses? Many of them, even today, reflect what I've found in the teens and 20s up through to the end of the century. Small businesses, um, like Binga said, Banker Binga said, that are really trying to make it within their neighborhood or community. A few that now are very entrepreneurial that have transcended that, but here we have this woman, Lexington Betty, who is in Southside, I think in the 90s. And unfortunately, her name is Dominic Leach, given name, but she names herself Lexington Betty after her grandmother. She's worked at Michelin starred restaurants. She's a, a queer woman with a wife and had a food truck in process of making uh, brick and mortar. And one night, a few years ago, her wife woke up because she heard a ruckus and uh, people who were anti-gay had set fire to their food truck. And they made a uh, GoFundMe and she's now got a place, which is good, but she wouldn't let herself be kept down, much like the people we see in the early part of the century. And this is a menu of what she has. And like several people, um, she is among a, a cadre of black chefs who are getting their product, making commercial products because as we know, the, the margins are very small for anybody in restaurant business and making products that can be sold retail. And I'm not, I don't know it, but there you have a market in Chicago called Mariano's that is selling some of these products. And um, the Candy Factory, Brown Sugar Bakery, um, the expansion, Eric Williams, who's won numerous awards and his uh, chef de cuisine just won the James Beard Rising Star Chef Award at the Beard Awards in June in Chicago, um, now has a second unit called Daisy May and also in Closer to the Loop, the Mustard Seed Kitchen. At one hand, you have to almost have a multi-unit operation to be able to break even. Um, and interestingly tonight, a little bit before our conversation, BEM Bookstore, which is in Bed-Stuy in New York, it's run by two sisters, that's a bookstore of food books, but not just cookbooks, uh, focusing on African-American, African diaspora cooking, but literature, poetry, where food is a focus, had a discussion and tasting with Taylor's Tacos. And I bring it up, not just because it happened, but this idea that, and this happened to me, that you could only, you look to me to make you fried chicken or grits and I do some of those dishes and enjoy them, but I was French trained. And so to see when I look around at what's out there that she's interested and excels at making tacos and has a pop-up taco stand um, in town. And as you see here, uh, Lexington Betty is the one I chose, but there are several people 
she has Wagyu beef franks that are sold in a supermarket um, to try to make sure she can stay in business. And if you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you all to look at the website, Black F&B. Other than El Simone, who's a dear friend and you might know from TV and media, because she's in America's Test Kitchen as the one of the lead test chefs. Um, everyone else that are pictured here and the next page are all Chicago entrepreneurs, uh, wine and spirits consultants. There's a woman who does um, wine lifestyle work. So from what I could determine from looking at her product, she's providing young people young black people with a way to have an inroad to get in touch and learn about wine, whether it's for their pleasure or social engagement, or as you all may know, and many people in uh, corporate jobs need to, uh, in some of these functions, be able to articulate that they're cultured. And so she's providing a means with which you can not feel uh, put upon or stupid if you don't have wine knowledge. And then when you're at a corporate dinner or social engagement, you're able to perform to a certain degree. Um, and here is the second page of this group. And they're very diverse. A couple of people are entrepreneurial businessmen who are doing multi-unit operations that do not have anything to do with what we would call soul food. Um, the, some people are French chefs, uh, bakers, etc. So I leave you there to say that when we think about Northern Illinois and Chicago, I really stress that we have to look past the monolith. We now have an African population. There's still a Haitian population um, as well as African-Americans uh, with a diversity of food and food ways and expertise and training. And I encourage everyone to if they're not doing it already, to try and um, support Black business and everywhere you can find it around the city and the region. Hopefully this was somehow in interesting. And if you have questions, I'll try my best to answer. It was great. Thank you. Excellent. That was really interesting. Um, Chicago is uh, one of America's, or has been one of America's most segregated cities. Yep. Uh, there are others that are worse, but but that in, in my reading of early Chicago, this is less so before 1919 and yeah. the horrible race riots. Uh, for, I'll give you an example. Um, the greatest restaurant in Chicago in the late 19th century was Kinsley's. And uh, Kinsley um, specifically made his restaurant non-segregated. And this shocked a lot of white, upper-class white people who went there. All the, anybody who's anybody went to that place. And he had, he allowed black, white, anybody else to come in and eat. And in fact, employed a largely black staff, including a chef uh, who carved roasts in the front of the restaurant when you walked in. Everybody who was anybody remembers that guy. And there were several of them, but he was always jolly and cheerful. And Kinsley did that to give black folk uh, 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 an image that Amer white people could uh, uh, associate with, link up to, like. Uh, so he was a really interesting guy. And um, too bad the restaurant went away and worse things happened after, but that's the way Chicago was early. Yeah, it was really fascinating to me. I kept running into that, looking in the um, archive, various archives, just as you said, that was, it was so hopeful. And yes, there was some negativity about association with prostitution and kind of mafiosos, et cetera, and the slumming that we have in New York as well. But overall, um, it was quite, and it was spoken about the possibilities that this was a very, um, you know, it, it, it was just 
opening up the city and that there were black businesses all over town and people trying to make their way, which I thought was quite interesting. And the one thing I, oh, I was gonna ask if you all know, they, I found one citation for some place outside, sounded like north of the city called Robbins, I think it's called. That was a community, a black community that yeah. they talk about and the right around the depression, maybe a little before the depression as having a very um, progressive mayor and they had a town council that was really like, they were defined as trustees and they really um, supported black business and they um, had their own nightlife that Chicagoans would come up to. It reminded me of in New York City, Yonkers used to be a place like that where people would go to just north of the city and there was gambling, et cetera, and nightclubs if you wanted to get out of kind of whatever Manhattan seemed like in that moment. And I, again, I don't, I'm not from this region, so I didn't know it to understand it in context and I couldn't find much data about it. Yeah. Eleanor, uh, Robbins is Southwest of Chicago. Southwest, right? okay. Yeah, I believe it's, yeah, I believe so. And if you look so, at- uh, Yeah, there are- Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say that it, it, when I look, I look through all of the green books that are existent and it's interesting, pretty quickly before 1940, you get about 25 ish hotels in Chicago. And the and you know it's hard to say because what did Victor Green, who were his centuries in the given city, but what what the growth uh up until the end of the 40s was in taverns and nightclubs, and then you saw growth in restaurants. In 1949, he makes a distinction, which I was curious about, where he gives the black traveler a variety of options, museums, libraries, zoo, aquarium, see, sites to see. It's the only time in Chicago he gives you a point of reference. And then consistently, it's Peoria, Danville, um, obviously East St. Louis, um, one other northern suburb, Waukegan, are places mm -hmm. for Blacks to be able to go that had restaurants and had um, uh, lodging. Some others that are more further south, but it was very interesting. Obviously Springfield too, but it's kind of up yeah. the, it's like the interstate around Chicago. Well, you'll notice that those are along with the railways. Those are railway, yeah, that, yeah, Peoria is a railway junction. And everybody knew about the Black Porters and um, the Union and, and the cooks who cooked on the, the on the railway, the Pullman um, cooks who were celebrated and people looked forward to travel uh, because of the food <laughs> that were served by, again, black, almost entirely black staff. And some of those translated to restaurants. Uh, like Rufus, the famous As Rufus. a result. You know yeah. Rufus. Rufus, absolutely good things to eat. Yeah. yeah. And I know so that there's I a black influence through all. There's a black influence through all of Chicago's food history, uh, no matter what it is. And that's the thing I'm very, was what caught me because I think, and I'm not trying to say anything to this group in particular, but the tendency is, and it's not just with blacks. We could say it about Mexicans to delimit and. Um, pick a certain three or four or six dishes and say that's what the cuisine is and not realize the influence they have in and outside of their own community within the larger food scene in various ways um, I thought was real interesting I had no idea that Joe Lewis had not surprising since he lost a lot of money uh, must have bought into a milk concern I don't know if you saw that advertisement for yeah. Joe Lewis milk yeah that was really um, interesting yeah it's interesting. Well, he was a hero. Well, the other is that um, New Orleans cuisine, this mashup of Cajun and Creole, uh, was always important in Chicago. 
and uh, be it's because the railway ran down, you know, and down the Mississippi. So that is that's another aspect of black cooking, certainly Creole, um, that we never think about. But it's in every every restaurant menu, every hotel menu had something New Orleans in it, a Creole in it. You could see it in some of those ads. I totally agree with you. Um, and it's funny, you know, if you, the way I always think of it, that Veracruz, Mexico is the southernmost part of the Caribbean and um, New Orleans is the northernmost on water. But you could argue that the Caribbean continues or that kind of flair with seafood particularly gets evidence in urban Midwest. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think probably we have to wind things up, don't, don't you? Brad, did you have any other uh, questions that needed to be fielded? Brad, are you there? Or Jerry? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I, I don't have anything else. Um, but I mean, if, if people, other people have questions, feel free to send yeah. them in the chat or just uh, speak up. You can unmute yourself and, and uh, ask. I think, did I see a hand go up over uh, here? Yes, sir. Randy. Um, besides SNCC and groups like that, I was wondering if you'd had a chance to look into the Black Muslims' influence in Chicago. I know that you know, Elijah Muhammad. To, yeah. I know Elijah Muhammad had a very elaborate theory as to the what kind of diet is suited to the Black nation. And it led to various things like a polemic against the sweet potato pie and a championing of the bean pie as a in distinction to that. And that's partly why they used that as a fundraiser in different cities in the North. And still do. And I thought about it, yep. but it was another thing I couldn't take on, but I you're it's a good point and the bean pie i'm always curious because on the one hand it's like I, when i was a much younger person i loved creme brulee i still do but I, I didn't know that when you add the sugar you don't get the benefit of the vitamin quantity of the quality of the dairy products you just get the fat so the bean pie as a nutritional idea is really antithetical um, to what I think he wanted. Um, mm. And the other part of it I would add to your good intervention is that one of the things he stressed was he didn't want anybody eating slave food. So obviously no pork on my fork. So things like um, pork ribs or chitlins would not be in their lexicon. Um, and this very stress, you know, cause then that, um, Poe, among others, talk about this question of soul food because soul food is a late arrival in our vocabulary. And in my mind, often it's a, a dog whistle to say black Southern food. And when it's white Southern food, we just say Southern food. And so when you look at somebody like the black Muslims, they're very keen on separating themselves from what would be seen as slavery, what would be equated to be slave rations um, or lesser cuts, et cetera. I don't, you know, I don't study them per se, but I would be curious to do an analysis on the level of, at the end of the day, how nutritious is it really, or is it really just a polemical diet that really doesn't nourish you particularly given the spate of um, hereditary diseases you can have as an African-American, is, is it doing good service in the long haul? I don't know. Right. And just sort of to, to wind up a little bit here, uh, our because our organization is so interested in the evolution and history of, of recipes, uh, we reached out to a, um, a local food uh, black food journalist, and uh, she has provided us with what would be some contemporary um, iterations of uh, of recipes, and those are on our website. If anyone would be interested to to go there, just a couple examples there. And if I could just say mm -hmm. something, 
the person you're talking about is Charlotte Draper. Who I am, yeah. Yeah, the 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 chef in the Ebony Test Kitchen. Right, she was yep. she was uh, one of the former directors of um, yep. the Ebony Test Kitchens and is now doing and craft and craft. She was your maid at craft, right? Yeah, and craft and Campbell's and uh, um, Southern Living Magazine. Southern Living Charlotte's Magazine, quite a, well. a, a a good uh, professional yeah. history. She's she's a wonderful person. Yeah, really, she's good people, Charlotte. <laughs> Is yeah. Tracy Poe's dissertation available in book form or online or anything? You know, I found it online through a library. I don't know if it was Harvard or my library. It's because there's a very famous article that, in essence, distills the Black chapter. Because I think she deals with Swedes, Italians, Blacks, maybe Poles too. Yeah. Um, I could send to you all the link that i got i think it's pretty standard if it's interest of interest it is i, I have it also i can send it to you i knew her are oh, you knew her I know. well she, she well she dropped out it's just a kind of interesting story i just met one of her best friends i hadn't seen her in years and years and uh she had had personal problems lived in evanston for many years incognito and is now lives in Massachusetts in Boston. Wow, she but did such good work. I wrote her. She did. I told. I sent her a long email saying, um, "I just got this contact with you." She never answered. I think she doesn't want to do it anymore, or gave it up years ago. There you go. But maybe one. But that article is is available. Is widely available. You should read it. Maybe one last question is getting on here, at least in out east, close to 10 o'clock, and anybody out east is probably wondering. Um, we are recording this, and, and uh, Scott, um, Bradley, you're going to be sending out the link, and we're going to be posting it so people can, uh, can, uh, can listen to this on their own. A couple last, a last question or two, does someone have for Dr. Barton? Okay, uh, this has been wonderful. We really appreciate all the time and effort. Um, we apologize to everybody for the uh, technical problems, but I think we've all worked with technology and know that it's just like happens to itself. Uh, Dr. Barton, can you send us, would you mind sending us your, uh, your email to the to the group so that if they have some further questions or they're sure, happy to touch with you? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to. Yeah, if you send it to Brad, thank you. I'm sure thank you. That out too. Brad, do you have something else? Well, thank you as well. No, uh, thanks for um, you know bearing with uh, bearing with me with the through the uh, technical difficulties. It's a wonderful presentation, and uh, I look forward to hearing more about this and and checking out more of uh, Dr. Barton's work and uh, mm -hmm. just yeah everything else that's that's picked up. And so I can put together sort of a once I send out a link to the. Um, where, wherever we end up posting the uh, video, I can also put together kind of a compendium of other sources that might have links to, uh, oh. for example, the recipes. And then if there are some articles and some other things that might be, you know, kind of part of a, uh, some resources that are relevant, um, I'll be sure to include all that. Wonderful. Yeah, we we have not collected African American recipes. We haven't been to any. For some reason, we've only been in the in small towns in Illinois and we haven't come across them but we'd love to do our recipe road shows um and collect them but so if Scott if you run across anybody let us know Wonderful. you know um oh, what's his name um uh William Rubel has a project out of Santa California trying to do just that you know he's in you ever meet him at Oxford you know, he wrote yeah. that. Oh, yeah, I know. I, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm, he's I'm on his to, bread, bread Facebook page. Yeah, exactly. Because he's trying to do yep. a project to um, interrogate Melinda Russell's work and have people cook from her book and then look at the recipes and try to analyze it and try to do it as a way to create interracial connectivity around food. That's, That's interesting. Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll drop my note. Maybe, now that you're up in Indiana, maybe we can work on that with you too. 
Okay. Get some to get yeah. Yeah. Thank, okay. uh, thank, la thank you. Just the last thing. Thank you so much, Scott. This was wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you. Can, all. can I say one more thing? Absolutely. Scott, it was great. <laughs> can I say, no, this is about Randy Schwartz is with the uh, Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor, and they're having a program on the 15th with Zoe Veit on uh, cooking in the Gilded Age. And she does work at the Michigan State uh, collection, you know, of um, cookbooks oh, wow. and That's such. Sure. So, it, it, so go to go to their website, and uh, it should be good, Randy. Yep. That's great. Yeah. Fo focusing on the uh, the difference between the food of the one percenters and the ninety nine percenters in the Gilded. Oh, oh. oh that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I knew Jan back in the day. She was around. Well, Helen Zoe Veit is actually at Michigan State University, not at the University of Michigan. Yeah, Michigan State, yeah. Did I say Michigan? Uh oh, that's a no-no with Michigan, you were thinking I know. Of, I think you were thinking of Jan Longoni's archive, yep. but that's at the University of Michigan. Helen, yeah, Michigan State. It's at Michigan. Helen Zoe Veit is driving down from Michigan State for this. Got it. Okay. And it's by Zoom also, so everyone can see it. Cool. Wonderful. Well, it's well, nice to meet all. another group of culinary historians because I'm active in the New York culinary historians. Wonderful. Yeah. So, hey. Wonderful. We don't, we okay. Bye-bye. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. All right, thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.